Uh, I wanted to thank everybody for the lunch. Um, I speak for food now. <laughs> the ladies that brought the lunch, would you just raise your hands? You know, my wife Barbara told me there'll be no dinner tonight. <laughs> there is a combination of information here. Some of it is first hand, most of it is first hand, maybe 80%, 70%. Uh, uh, stuff that I experienced directly. And but there is at least 20% or 30% of really good information that we were able to gather after the war because things were happening that we just simply did not understand why they were happening or what was behind that and what caused that to happen. And then because of uh, really good German records uh, that were found after the war, we found out all kinds of things that, uh, that really surprised us. Uh, so the information that you're going to hear uh, comes from, uh, well, comes from several sources. It comes from first hand, then second-hand information that's been documented either by the uh, by German records uh, or by uh, Russian photographs or by American Army uh, records and photographs. So there's a lot of information here. And uh, the last thing I'd like to mention to you is the fact that uh, this is a very personal story because all I'm basically focusing on here is what happened to my family and what happened to me. So it becomes very, uh, very uh, personalized. And uh, I want to keep it that way because I really don't have time to talk about a lot of other stuff, like what was happening in the war or uh, why the war took as long as it did. I really don't have time for all that. So I'm focusing on a personal story. And I think what's interesting about this personal story, particularly as it applies to a 12 or 13 year old, which is what I was when I was liberated by the American Army, is that um, even though it's personal, it's very typical um, to the, for the children uh, or to the children that went through this. They went through very similar experiences. By that I mean they, um, they were separated from their parents. They had to move out of their homes. They, uh, they lost all their personal belongings. They were tattooed. They were hungry. Uh, they got sick. They were cold. Uh, they lost their parents. Um, so all of that is very typical. Uh, what happened to me is very typical of how other children were affected. Uh, millions of children, maybe a million and a half. What is atypical is the fact that I survived and most 11 and 12 year olds did not. So that's where the big difference is. It's not in the experience itself, it's in the fact that I survived and they did not. So uh, with that as, the, as a brief introduction, uh, here's the famous city of Prague uh, where, where I grew up uh, from the time that I was about two until uh, the, uh, til the Nazi uh, forces moved in in uh, in the spring of 1939. So this is really a, this is just a fantastic, from an architectural standpoint and historical standpoint, this is a fantastic place to visit. Some of you have been there. Uh, it has, uh, it has at least six or seven layers of uh, historical architecture, all the way from the Roman, uh, Romanesque to uh, Baroque, to uh, an early Gothic and then late Gothic, uh, and of course, uh, some contemporary uh, uh, architecture as well. So um, the city has a tremendously long history. It was built, most of it, or a lot of it was built out of the Roman Empire. Uh, a lot of the old bridges are still there that were built in the, in the, in the 11th and 12th century. Uh, I'm going to try to move. This is a. This is the apartment house where uh, that was owned by my 
maternal grandparents and my, uh, my mother's parents. And uh, we lived on the second floor. We had the apartment on the second floor. You can see that rectangular window there. That was uh, my, my brother's room and my room. Uh, my brother was uh, four years older uh, than me. And uh, to the left of that uh, bedroom was our, my parents' bedroom and then a uh, living room and uh, a library and then an office that belonged to my dad who was a physician, uh, be, uh, a uh, gynecologist. And uh, life was, uh, before the war, life was very comfortable for us. This apartment house actually was extremely well built. You see it here, uh, sort of as a rundown place, uh, but um, the reason it's rundown is because Barbara and I visited uh, the Czech Republic right after it became the Czech Republic, after it split from Slovakia uh, and became a free country and communism was basically folded up and was gone. And uh, this is what happens under the socialist regime. Typically nobody takes care of anything because nobody owns anything. So uh, this, this building is pretty much run down. It's been renovated since then. Uh, we, uh, <coughs> We grew up in a uh, in a uh, uh, family that was uh, had a Jewish heritage, but uh, as children we didn't we didn't know that we were Jewish. We were basically I know this sounds strange, but we were basically um, I felt like we were basically integrated into the into the Czech society. Uh, we uh, our we had we had one preacher. And that was my mother. She was the preacher, and she was the uh, she was the ethics lecturer. <laughs> she uh, was wonderful because uh, if I had to categorize her or put her in a place, uh, in a, if I were put her would have put her into a religious position, then she would have been a universalist. <laughs> She would have been. She would have encompassed all possible religious ideology as it as it exists around the world, and uh, she would have not taken any sides with anybody. Uh, but she would have promoted the the high level of ethics that uh, that that most religions uh, teach. So she was the best of the best, as far as I'm concerned. Uh, she is one of the reasons why, I, I feel like she's one of the reasons why, why I survived. Because she was, a, she was a confidence builder and a character builder and a, um, and a uh, ethical enforcer. So she could do it all and she did it really well. And she um, made you feel like you were special, that, like you were gifted like you were unique, and no matter what happens, she would say, keep your chin up, be proud of who you are, and uh, be a good person. So uh, so life really is not that complicated when it comes to ethics, if you keep it simple. And I think when it comes to children, you really got to keep it simple. You don't want to make it too complicated, because when you do, they won't listen. So um, in, in the spring of 1939, um, we um, we were still surrounded by music. We were still surrounded by art. We uh, we cherished um, the uh, the baby grand piano that we had at home. We cherished music. Everybody was everybody was a musician, particularly my parents and my older brother. Uh, I was heavily into art and uh, and sketching and drawing uh, as well as music. And uh, uh, life was um, very um, uh, life was very Spartan in terms of how we lived. <clears throat> the only major difference between us and uh, most of our neighbors was that my dad had a car. Cars were, you know, cars were really still something unique in the 1930s, and not everybody had an automobile. And uh, but in terms of 
uh, lifestyle, you know. We lived the same way that, that everyone else lived. And uh, I, did have, I did have that feeling, that, that inner, that conscious feeling that, um, that my family is something special. And uh, that feeling maybe was, I'm not criticizing it, maybe it was right, maybe it was wrong. But that feeling came from the fact that my dad was a physician. And I always felt that he, because he was a physician, I felt that he was making a huge contribution to society uh, by helping people to get better or to get well. Uh, I also admired his uh, education, his knowledge, and his ability to um, do more than just uh, be a good physician. He was a great pianist, he was a great photographer, he, had a, he was one of those multi-talented people and I really uh, admired him for that. Uh, in, uh, in the spring of 1939, to March 15th to be exact, my brother and I took a walk up to the very nearby uh, park. Uh, to kick the soccer ball. And as we approached the park, there was a, um, we discovered that there was a, uh, a big um, gun, gun emplacement with a soldier manning the gun. And uh, we were just fascinated by this huge piece of equipment uh, and the gun with a six or seven foot barrel with a soldier standing next to it. And we um, approached it and the soldier picked us up, picked me up, and put me in the seat of the gun behind the, behind the site. And then I was about six and a half, and I was in first grade. And uh, we then, shortly after that, we realized that we were just invaded by, by the Nazi regime, by, the Ger by Germany. It was March 15, 1939. And uh, we came home, and. It was verified by our parents that we uh, were invaded, that we are now under the control of the Germans. And uh, shortly after that, we, uh, I would say within two or three months after that, we were subject to uh, huge anti-Semitic anti -Semitic propaganda through, that whole, through the whole city, with uh, signs uh, everywhere, uh, Jews not allowed. Uh, Juden verboten. Uh, on top of the library, uh, public libraries, movie houses, coffee houses, uh, uh, department stores. And soon after that, we had to wear a, a Jewish star on our uh, on our coats, on the out, outer clothing. Um, so we had to be, we were identified as being Jewish. All of this came as a surprise because if somebody would have asked me, who are you, I would say, I'm Czech, I'm, I'm from Prague, I'm Czechoslovakia. I would have never said I'm Jewish. But nevertheless, we were, uh, we had to put up with it, obviously, we had no choice. And uh, I think as I entered, as I entered set, second grade, we were both, my brother and I were kicked out of school out of public school, which was which happened the following years. So I was in second and my brother was in sixth grade and we were both kicked out. No Jews were allowed to go to public schools. And my dad, um, my dad's practice was closed and he worked, uh, he could not work by on his own, so he worked in a hospital uh, in Prague. And then uh, one day, this is about a year after the, the Nazis took over, uh, we got a surprise uh, visitor. The doorbell rang, my mother went to the door, and uh, there was a secret service, a Czech secret service agent with, a, uh, with an SS officer and his wife, either his wife or his girlfriend. And they walked in without saying no all. They just barged in. <coughs> And I still remember my mother saying, they didn't even say, good morning, can we enter, can we look at your apartment? They just basically walked in. And 
I remember my mother saying, I did not say hello to them because they didn't have the decency to even say hello or introduce themselves when they came in. So they went through the apartment, looked at the bedrooms, looked at the, looked at the kitchen, um, and walked through, and then they left. And I think within two or three weeks after that, we were uh, told to move out of the apartment and to leave everything behind. Leave the piano, leave the oriental rugs, leave the furniture. Basically, we took our some of the, our personal belongings, a bunch of suitcases, uh, and we uh, moved to a smaller apartment across town that belonged to uh, distant relatives of ours. And it was like a three-bedroom apartment. We had two bedrooms, and they had their own bedroom. Very dark, very very dingy place. Uh, we were there till uh, we were there for about a year, almost a year, and then in uh, in the summer of uh, 1942, we were asked to uh, assemble at one of the small railroad stations in Prague, and uh, we were transported to a ghetto. These are pictures actually taken during the war of, uh, of Jewish families um, being transported into the ghetto of uh, Theresienstadt, which was a, which is a German word for a little town outside of Prague, about an hour outside of Prague. Uh, and uh, Theresienstadt is one of those uh, old uh, little towns that has a big wall around it. It was built as a defensive, little defensive town. Um, uh, there might have been a boat there too at one time with some water, but what remained was that big uh, 15 or 16 foot wall. And uh, so what the uh, what the Nazis did, they kicked everybody out of Theresienstadt. About 10,000 uh, Czech uh, residents, families, um, they kicked them out and, and made it into a Jewish ghetto. So they could round up all the Jews in, uh, in Slovakia, in the Czech Republic, and a few from Germany and Austria. And uh, it became a staging place. Uh, the first stage, obviously, was to round everybody up so that they are not part of the general society. And the second stage was something we didn't know about. The second stage uh, was to uh, ship them out and kill it, which we didn't know when we first moved into Theresienstadt. So uh, my brother and I ended up in this, uh, what used to be a public school in, uh, in Theresien, and uh, they converted the public school to, uh, into dormitories and with bunk beds. And uh, the boys uh, were separated from the girls, so we were in the, in the school that was totally for boys, and then there was another school that was totally uh, uh, accommodating uh, girls. And then uh, in terms of the grown-ups, my, my parents were separated. Men and women were immediately separated from each other. So my mother was in, in uh, separate barracks, uh, military barracks from my father. And uh, most of the grown-ups, most of them, not all of them, had some kind of a job. My mother worked in a large kitchen that cooked the meals for thousands of people, like a military kitchen. And my father worked at a clinic in, uh, in Theresienstadt. Uh, Theresienstadt was interesting because we as children didn't really understand uh, that this is a temporary place, that this is a staging place, until one of the boys came uh, into the room, into one of these rooms. Uh, by the way, this, this is a real picture of that school taken right after the war, when the World War ended. So he walks into this one of these rooms where I was, and uh, they're all upset. And I said to him, what is, uh, what's going on? Why, why are you crying? And he said to me, well, um, it, it seems like my grandmother uh, 
took an overdose of sleeping pills and uh, she's in a coma and uh, it looks like she's not going to wake up. And I, did, I dug deeper, which I'm really good at. And uh, I said, well, what, what do you think caused this? Why would she have taken sleeping pills? And he said to me, well, she was told that uh, she was going to be shipped east to get ready for a transport and she was going to be shipped east. Now east would have been Poland. And I said, oh, okay. So that was the first time that I heard this idea that uh, there are prisoners from Theresa H. Dutt that are being shipped out of Theresa H. Dutt. And it was the first time that I was told. Uh, you have to understand that children were not given the information by their parents that typically uh, they would have gotten. Uh, my parents and other parents kept any kind of threatening information from us. So even though the grown-ups knew that transports were leaving Terenzienstadt and that people were being shipped east, we never knew it until I found out directly from this kid uh, that was in my room. Uh, I, uh, Theresienstadt was an interesting place. It was, uh, it was definitely a, uh, a, uh, a concentration camp, even though you, you can refer to it as ghetto, but it was definitely a camp because we were surrounded by this big wall. We couldn't get out. We had uh, virtually no information from the outside, so we couldn't get we couldn't get any news, we didn't have a radio, we couldn't listen to any news, we had no idea what was happening on the outside. And uh, we had limited, limited food supply, limited medical uh, facilities, um, death rate was very high, maybe 15-20% death rate uh, among healthy, what otherwise would have been healthy people. Uh, medical care was meager because of supplies, lack of supplies. Um, Theresienstadt was definitely a staging place and as we go through this, I'll explain to you uh, what happened uh, to us and to other people. Uh, we were, uh, I spent, we spent, we meaning the kids, spent the mornings in very impromptu, very casual uh, discussions in this school. We would have um, 18, 20 year old um, leaders that would take us through history, some basic math, basic discussion about sociology and history, world history. We had no books, we had no uh, study guides, so it was very informal type of learning. And uh, in the afternoon, typically, we were free to wander around the town and visit with our parents, uh, maybe watch a soccer game among some of the prisoners. And uh, I spent some time sketching and drawing outside. I was able to get a pencil and, a, and some paper and do some sketches on the outside. One of them I found after the war. It was at the museum in uh, it is at the museum in Theresienstadt. And so life was very, uh, very simple, very restricted. Uh, and uh, uh, we were just hoping that the war would be over soon so we could get out and go back home and be reunited with our friends and go to school and start a regular life. That didn't happen. Uh, in December of uh, of 1943, we were um, asked to assemble at the railroad station in Theresienstadt. We were loaded on um, onto a uh, train, which was a uh, train designed to transport cattle. So trains were not passenger trains were not available because they were used by the army, by the by the, by the German army. So we were loaded up into a cattle train, cattle cars. Uh, something like 70 or 80 people per car. I don't really know how many exactly. But we were jammed into this kettle car with really no place to sit. We had a huge bucket of drinking water and then we had a bucket uh, for human waste, 
nobody really, I don't remember anybody going to the bathroom because uh, you couldn't. I mean, there's no way you were going to go, go and relieve yourself in front of 60 or 70 people. So um, we traveled for two and a half days, um, night and day, uh, and we ended up, uh, we ended up on this platform, which we found out later on that it was the platform of the Auschwitz-Birkenau concentration camp. Now Auschwitz-Birkenau are really the same place. Uh, Auschwitz is the old camp, Birkenau is the addition to Auschwitz. So uh, it was referred to as when Birkenau was, when Auschwitz was expanded and Birkenau was built uh, later, like in 41, 42, um, it was then called Auschwitz Birkenau. Uh, we arrived at uh, around 11 30, 12 o'clock at night, so we didn't really see this view of the uh, platform. This is taken, obviously, this is taken during the day, this picture here. And, uh, what was interesting about our arrival, and this is something we found out later on, that looking back, what was interesting about our arrival, or unique about our arrival, is that we were all put on trucks, and we were transported into the main camp from this railroad platform. And so, basically, this was Auschwitz-Birkenau. This is what you saw as you approached the main camp. A high security prison surrounded by uh, machine gun towers and high voltage electric barbed wire. You couldn't even get close to this wire here. If you got within five inches, you were in trouble because of the magnetic force that existed in this uh, highly electrified uh, wire. So here is what was truly unique about our arrival. Typically, and this applies to perhaps a million and a half people or close to that, typically most transports arriving at the Auschwitz Birkenau platform were almost immediately separated in such a way that the children, the young children and the mothers when were, were transported into the gas chambers upon arrival, and the elderly. A few people that were able to work, and there were several factories around Auschwitz-Birkenau, German factories, munition factories, chemical factories, E.K. Farben, uh, other uh, uh, Bosch, other German factories that were manufacturing various military and chemical uh, goods. So some of the workers, some of the younger people, 25 year olds, 30, 30 year old, even 40 year olds, would be spared because they were, they represented the workforce that, that the SS was looking for. But perhaps as much as, as many as 70 or 80 percent of the people would automatically be taken to the gas chambers and, and killed and then cremated and basically turned into ashes. So that was typical of Auschwitz-Birkenau. Auschwitz-Birkenau killed between 1.2 and 1.4 million people. There is a big controversy about how many people actually died there, but it was horrendous. There are people that were there for three years or longer that saw the transports come in, saw the transports disappear in the gas chambers, uh, wrote books about it, had all kinds of documents about it and claimed that there was as many as two or two and a half million people killed. That might be an exaggeration, but there is a very conservative number which, which has been accepted, uh, gen generally accepted, which is 1.2 million. That's a lot of people. 1.2 million people killed in the gas chambers at Auschwitz Birkenau. Uh, we didn't know any of this as we arrived. We didn't even know we were in Auschwitz-Birkenau for like the next day. So, uh, so we are here, and uh, we we walk into the we are transported into the camp, and uh, here is an American uh, 
uh, air, air, aircraft photo taken around 1944. Uh, from for, of just one of the new, this is the new section of Birkenau. This is not Auschwitz, this is Birkenau. So we are put into, uh, so we are put into one of these barracks. Every one of those little lines is a barrack that may hold five or three or four hundred people. So we are, we are separated uh, from our, uh, the men and, and the male and female becomes a separation. And we are put into one of these barracks. So my mother is in the, in the female section of the camp that we are in, and my brother and my father and I are in the male section of the camp, but it's the same, basically the same camp. And uh, the next day, we go through showers, we uh, get a haircut, we get tattooed, and uh, we get, uh, uh, as I remember, we get a uh, different type of clothing from, from the civilian clothing that we had previously. <coughs> And we were put into one of these barracks, and I'm there with my dad and my brother. And we take the, the upper bunk, because we felt the upper bunk was safer and warmer. So we climb up, and we take over all those upper bunks. And my mother, who is maybe 200 yards away in the, uh, in the female section, uh, I visit her, like, on the second day. I go and look for her, and I visit with her on the second day. And we, before I go into the, into the scenario of what I found out in my mother's uh, barrack, uh, I really need to tell you that we were immediately uh, shocked by this whole scenario. This, I mean, this was, this was a serious, uh, high, high level, uh, high security prison with virtually no food. There was, uh, typically coffee in the morning. There was maybe a slice of bread and some soup at lunch and another bowl of soup at, at night. So everybody is like viciously hungry from, the, from day one. Uh, in terms of number of calories per day, maybe, maybe 800, maybe 1,000 calories per day. Ridiculous because you need like 2,200 or 2,300 minimum in this December Polish winter. So uh, probably half of the food that you would normally require. So everybody's starving and everybody's waiting for the next piece of bread and so forth. And uh, I am uh, wandering through the camp and going into the female section and I find my mother and I spent about an hour or so uh, in her bunk talking to her. And, and then I'm, as I'm walking out of her, uh, out of her uh, place, which looks very similar to this. So as I walk all the way to the end of the barrack, I realize that there is a room, a little small, 10 by, maybe 10 foot by 10 foot room to the right, and another 10 by 10 foot room to the left, uh, as, I, as I'm ready to exit her barrack. And I look into the room that's to the right, and I look through the window, uh, the door has a little window in it, and I look through there, and there is a, an easel and a woman, a young woman sitting and painting a portrait. And I'm thinking, boy, you gotta be kidding me. There is, I'm in a prison camp, and there is somebody here doing art, but I'm very interested in this, so I'm looking at her. Plus, she was really good looking at the same time, really attractive woman. So I'm looking at this young woman painting, it looks like she's painting a picture, and uh, she sees me looking at her, and I, uh, she, she goes, come on in. So I open the door, and uh, I, I go in, and uh, she introduces herself as, as being Dina. Uh, she said, I'm Dina, and uh, what's your name? And I, I said, I'm, uh, I'm uh, Michael, Misha. That's my, my middle name. So Misha in Czech is Michael in English. So I'm Misha. I, she says, you know, she said, did you come from Theresienstadt? I said, yes. 
Well, she said, I came from Theresienstadt in, uh, in September. So I've been here, you know, she's been there like, for four months already. And uh, so uh, later on I find out that Dana is an artist. She studied art in Prague. And uh, she, when she came with the sem September transport of the 5,000 prisoners from Theresienstadt, just like we did in December, it was 5,000 of us. When she came in, she proceeded to paint um, pictures on the wall of the children's barrack. There was a children's barrack that was established in September. We were not in it. My, my brother and I were with our father. Uh, in September, four months before we got there, there was a children's barrack. And uh, Dina decided that she's going to do something for fun for those children. And she painted a picture of, um, of Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs from memory. She painted that on one of the walls of the barrack. One of the assess guys, come, the assess men comes in and says uh, to, the, to the people there in the barrack, to the people that were the leaders of the kids, who did this? And uh, one of the prisoners said, it was Tina Gottlieb that did, she's an artist. Okay, so what happened was um, they, this SS guy, goes back to Dr. Mengele, who was the, one of the uh, doctors for our camp, in charge of our camp. And uh, he tells Dr. Mengele, he says, uh, we have a, he says, it looks like we have an artist in our prison group. Mengele, who is in charge of uh, our camp, which was called a family camp, the, the Theresienstadt family camp, um, Mengele gets hold of that idea that he is going to have Dina paint portraits of gypsy prisoners. And the reason he wanted to document uh, the, the facial uh, physiognomy, the coloring, the eye colors, the hair, he wanted very, very realistic portraits of the prisoners of gypsy prisoners that he was going to kill in a gas chamber. But before he killed them, he wanted to document, have Dina document them in the best way that she could. Um, the reason is unknown. He must have found that, must have considered something special about their appearance, about their skin coloring and so forth, or about their bone structure, but also he also knew that uh, color photography was still at its uh, infancy and that she could probably do a better job and be more realistic than a color photograph at that time in 1944. 43. 44, I'm sorry. So, uh, so here is Mankele. And uh, this is typical of one of the portraits that Dina did while I was there watching her paint. I, was, I would visit my mother and I would spend time with my mother and I would go and visit with Dina. And uh, uh, on about the third, oh, by the way, there are, she did a total of maybe 12 or 13 of these. And then um, I think there are as a total of three or four at the uh, Auschwitz Museum in Poland. The originals, one, this is one of them. That are, that, that are still at the museum in Poland. So, um, to move along, um, on about the third day that I was visiting with Dina, she said to me, I would like, she said, Misha, I would like to introduce you to my boyfriend, uh, Willie. And Willie was the head of, the, of our camp. He was a prisoner, but he was the capo or the, the overseer of our family camp. Uh, the reason I brought up the uniqueness of the landing at the, at the platform, the way we arrived at the platform, and the way we were brought into the camp, into the family camp, this was a truly unique scenario. Never before has this happened. 
that whole families, grandparents, parents, uh, children, would be brought into the same camp and not be guests. And what we found out after the war, this is the secondary information, what we found out after the war was that <clears throat> There was a concern by the Nazis that, that the International Red Cross out of Switzerland was going to inspect some of the camps. They did inspect Theresienstadt. And the Germans wanted to make sure that if there, if there is an inspection, let's say, of Theresienstadt, and somebody says, well, there's only 30,000 people here in Theresienstadt, where is the other? 150,000 or whatever that you brought in here. They had an escape route. They could say, well, they are in the family camp. We established family camps. And one of those family, family camps is in Auschwitz. That was just a concern. I don't think that the Amer I don't think that the Nazis would ever allow the American, the International Red Cross to even come close to Auschwitz. But I think it was one of their possible escape routes that in case they insisted to come into Auschwitz and we had to give in, we would have a, we would have a Czech family camp with 10 or 15,000 prisoners in it. We could show that the children, the grandparents, and the parents are all together and doing okay. So this is just a possibility, but this is the explanation, one of the explanations for the Czech family camp being established. In, uh, in, in Auschwitz, Birkenau. Um, it is one of the reasons why some of us, some of us have survived. This is why I'm, why I'm here. So it's, it's, an, it's an important issue. Uh, Willy Brachmann was a political prisoner. He, um, he apparently uh, had a police record when he was living in Hamburg, Germany as a, as a 20 year old or 18 year old. He was imprisoned by, by the Germans, by the German government, and by the SS. Uh, then he was sent to a couple of concentration camps because they didn't know what to do with him. And then from one of the other concentration camps, uh, I don't know if it was Buchenwald or one of them, he was sent into Auschwitz and became, shortly after he was sent into Auschwitz, he became the head of our Czech Jewish family camp, uh, and he was a good man. He um, never did anyone any harm that I could see. He was he he handled himself really well. I met him. Dean I introduced me to him uh, about a week after I arrived in Auschwitz, and uh, it was uh, it was the first break that I got was the break of working as a messenger for Willy Brachmann. So I became his sidekick. So I suddenly was given better clothing, I had a better pair of shoes, I was given some extra food that I could share with my family, and uh, I was now protected by the top prisoner in the camp, who was uh, Willy Brachmann. By the way, Willy Brachmann did survive the war, I found out later on that he did survive the war. I never met him after the war, but he went back to Hamburg, was married, had a couple of kids, and he did, he did survive the war. So um, it didn't take me long. Um, I'm almost 12 years old then. It didn't take me long, long to realize that um, this is an extermination camp. It was, um, it was a matter of personal observation, it was a matter of what other people told me what was going on, combination of the two. It was also evident uh, by the tremendous amount of smoke that was coming out of the crematoria night and day. It was evident by the smell of the smoke, you could smell human flesh. It was evident by the tremendous amount of uh, ash in the air. If the wind was blowing just in the right direction from the crematoria to where we were, we were literally covered in human ash. Our hair, our face, our hands, shoes, everything was covered by human ash. So it was, uh, I approached my parents, uh, uh, 
about two weeks or three weeks after our arrival in Auschwitz, and I said to them, this place is hell, it's exterminating people, it's killing people every day. You can see it's burning people, and my parents just looked at me and didn't say a word. So I knew that uh, what I was saying uh, was holding water, they was right. So, uh, so moving along um, here, um, you've heard about the experiments that Mengele did on the twins. I won't we'll get into that, but uh, he was hung up on these on these experiments, trying to figure out how does one twin react, one twin one twin being the control, the other twin being the one that the experiments are being uh, done on. Uh, very gruesome totally unethical from a medical standpoint. Um, so uh, life went on and my dad was lucky enough to get a position in a very primitive clinic in, uh, in the Czech family camp, very primitive. One room with some basic um, medical supplies um, that um, I, I know we didn't have any any anesthesia or anything like that. But one room with some basic uh, medical supplies that uh, with two or three doctors that were trying to save people with uh, serious injuries or various types of illnesses. Uh, my mother did not have any position at all. None of us really had any, any kind of work. We were not dedicated to any kind of uh, workforce into any kind of workforce or anything like that. Um, in uh, in uh, March of uh, 1944, we are now in the camp from December into March, and in March of 1944, the SS apparently already knew. This is post-war information now. The SS already knew in March of 44 that the International Red Cross went through Terzienz, got through the ghetto. Um, they saw what they saw and they told the SS headquarters in Berlin that they have no plans to make any further uh, visits to any other camps. So in March of 1944, was like the second week in March. The SS decided to liquidate the Czech family camp. So uh, first in, first out. So the September transport, the 5,000 people that came in September from Theresienstadt were gassed in March of 1944. Dina survived, her mother survived, only because she had connections uh, through Mengele. Uh, there were perhaps six or seven other people, but 98% of the 5,000 people, or at this point 4,000, because 1,000 already died anyway, uh, as a result of being in the camp. So roughly 4,000 people uh, were, were gassed, children, mothers, grandparents, and so forth. This was, the, this was the September transport, it's gone now. So in July of 1944, and to be exact, July 6, 1944, the remaining 5,000, almost 5,000, that came with me in December had to go through what was called a medical selection. A medical selection meant, and uh, I was too uh, naive to realize what we are going through. I thought it was just a medical uh, exam by an angular. So we are going through this medical exam my brother and I, and maybe three or four hundred other children. We are going through the medical exam. It's July 6th, the sun is out. It's about 65 degrees, 70 degrees. We are very comfortable. We got our shirts off. We have just our trousers on. And uh, we are now promenading in front of Mengele, who is at a long table, a long wooden table outside with two of his sidekicks, SS officers. Uh, looking on, and uh, uh, there is maybe three or four hundred children uh, from the age, 
from four or five years old till up to 15, 16 years old. And everybody's roaming around, running around, and uh, we go in a line in front of Mengele, and he points me to the left of the table. And my brother, who had a, a deformed left leg, had a birth defect, and he was limping a little bit. Um, he, uh, as soon as Mengele saw my brother limp, limping, he also moved him over to the left of the table. So now we are, my brother and I are on the left of Mengele's table with maybe 150, 200 uh, younger children. Uh, and uh, suddenly, out of nowhere, comes Billy Grafman. He's the cop that I'm working for as, a, as his messenger. And he comes out very quickly. And, uh, and he's, we are about 40 feet from Mengele. He comes out, he grabs me by my arm, and he quickly moves me into a group of older kids. They look like they're 14 or 15, 16 year old boys, about 15 feet on the right side of Mengele's table. And he moves me into this group of 14 and 15 year olds and disappears. And it was at that moment that I realized that really just saved my life. That I was on death row and I would have been killed three days later in the ghetto. But because he knew me and I knew him and he knew my father and so forth, uh, he decided, you know, that I would not be killed. So he took me over there and moved me into this group of almost 90 boys, most of them 14 and 15 years old. They were spared by Mengele because labor was his thought. I'm gonna need people that can, the SS and the Germany is gonna need people that can work. Maybe rebuild Germany, maybe reconstruct some of the factories, whatever. Whatever his idea was, we were saved. We were then moved into the men's camp, which was maybe a quarter of a mile away. Uh, my brother was doomed, and at that point I didn't realize that he was doomed. I thought that she, he might still survive. And uh, I was able to say goodbye to my mother, and I said goodbye to my father, who, who was also moved to another camp, to a medical camp. And uh, basically, uh, what I found out later on after the war, that uh, was that my mother decided, realized that my brother was going to be gassed and she volunteered to stay with him. She would not want him to go into the gas chamber by himself. So he volunteered, she volunteered to go with him and uh, so she stayed and so did many other mothers uh, when the selection was all done with. And uh, she uh, wrote this note to my father the day that she was going to be gassed. So this is dated July 11th, I believe. Uh, it's dated July 11th when they were gassed. The note basically, I think I have some notes here. Uh, what it says is uh, just in a Basically, uh, this is kind of a little bit abbreviated. There were, there were a couple of words that I couldn't have trouble translating, uh, had trouble reading, actually. Uh, but basically, uh, this is 99% of the note. This is about 99% of the note. She, she, she's writing, of course, in Czech, but the translation here. <clears throat> this is actually better than what's in the, I gave this letter to the Holocaust Museum in Washington, D.C. This is actually more detailed than what's in the museum, uh, the translation that the museum is, is using. So, my dearest, we are in, my dearest, we are in isolation, meaning now the people that were left in this Czech family camp, they are totally isolated. Nobody comes in, nobody goes out. They are under total isolation. Uh, we got we got in touch with Willie, and he left us with no doubt. We considered uh, we considered uh, hiding, but we dropped the idea. 
it would have been hopeless. The famous trucks are already here and we are waiting for it to begin. I took five bromides and I'm quite calm. So bromides were taken at that time, uh, was one of the few uh, medications that you could take uh, as a calming medication or as a sleep medication, something that would calm you down. I don't know where she got hold of the bromides, but she did. But she said, I took five bromides and I'm, I'm quite calm. My only one, my, de my dearest, don't blame yourself. This was our destiny. Stay healthy and remember my words, that time will heal, if not completely, at least most of it. I will be thinking about you and Michael and Misha into eternity, yours, Vilma. So uh, I discovered this letter um, in my dad's uh, bedroom when he passed away in uh, New York City in 1967, uh, and I had it. Obviously, I had it at home for years, many years, more than 50 years. Finally decided that uh, I wanted other people to see it because it's really a, a, a great document. Uh, and I gave it uh, to the Holocaust Museum about three years ago. And, uh, and they were just so delighted to have this letter because it's the only document that they have. It's the only artifact that they have that is written by a prisoner just an hour or two before that prisoner was killed. There is nothing like this in, in, in the Holocaust Museum. It's a unique, it's truly a unique document and they are just thrilled to have this document. Uh, so uh, I was put into me, just the, the 90 boys and myself, walked over into the men's camp, which was like three or four hundred yards away. And we were, I was put into a small medical clinic where there were two uh, dentists and uh, two or three surgeons. Again, a very primitive medical clinic in the men's camp. The rest of the 88 or 89 boys were put into another block, which actually was a bad place to be. They were put into what was called the punishment block, where they would, uh, block meaning one of those barracks, where they would bring in, uh, when, when a prisoner did something wrong or did something illegal, they would bring him in and beat the hell out of him. That was the punishment block. So these 89 or 88 boys were put in the punishment block. I was the only one put into this uh, clinic under the uh, umbrella of these two Polish dentists. And who was behind all this? Willy Bratma. He must have been because he must have arranged it because I was the only one that was put into this clinic under these, under these two uh, Polish dentists' uh, care. And uh, they were great. They, you know, they took care of me. They made sure that I had enough food and so forth. And I'm sure it was Willy Brachman because I found out after the war that they, when Willy came into the camp, he was missing a couple of front teeth. And they were the ones that replaced his front teeth with artificial teeth. So he made that connection with these two Polish dentists. And when the Czech family camp was being evacuated, evacuated and Willy knew where I was going, he made sure that I'm taking, going to be taken care of and that I would end up in the clinic rather than in the punishment block where the other 88 or 89 boys ended up. Uh, my dad was put in the medical camp, which was F Lager, like A, B, C, D, E, F. And he was there till I think it was October of 1944 because I saw him being uh, transported out. He walked out of the camp in the fall of 44. October of 44. And I was able to wave goodbye to him. I was able to throw some, uh, throw an overcoat and a couple of boots over the wire to him. Uh, actually, actually the overcoat went over the wire and the, one of the boots got hung up on top of the wire and he never got 
never got the second boot, but um, which upset me terribly because um, I wanted him to have this this pair of boots, new pair of boots that I was able to get. And uh, but I did find out after the war from him that he had good shoes but did not have a good coat. So so the overcoat I was able to organize for him uh, did go over and, and he did use the overcoat. Uh, he was shipped to Germany. He stayed. Um, he was in two or three concentration camps in Germany. He finally escaped uh, when they walked him and several hundred other prisoners to another camp. At night, he and three other prisoners escaped and uh, when, all the, when the guards were asleep. And uh, he ended up in the woods, hiding in the woods for about a week until the American army came. And, and then he joined the American army. This was, it was May of 1945. So I stayed in, in Birkenau uh, in this clinic. Um, and I stayed there till, uh, I stayed there till uh, January, January of 1945. Um, before I leave uh, Auschwitz, this is the commandant of, uh, of Auschwitz. His name, his last name was S. H O S S O had a umlaut over it, and, and this is after he was captured. Captured after the war, and um, he testified that um, he actually admitted that they were um, attempting to increase the death rate as much as possible because that's what Himmler. The head of SS out of Berlin wanted them to do. They wanted to increase the death rate and kill as many people as possible. And he claimed that the record killing in the gas chambers, and I don't know exactly when that was, when that record uh, happened, but he used the number of 5,000 per day was the record. So even, I think that number is low because uh, the gas chambers were, were uh, capable of doing more than that, but the problem was there was not a, enough capacity in the ovens. So it was not killing people, it's burning the people, turning them into ash. That's, that's where the problem was. So what they basically did was, so even if you take his word as being the right one, the number, 5,000, just think about it, 50,000 people in 10 days, that's a lot of people. 50,000 in 10 days, 150,000 people a month, it, it's probably pretty close. It's probably pretty close. 150,000 people a month is probably very close. It might have been a little more because they were not burning them all in the gas ovens, uh, in the coal ovens. They were also burning them outside. Uh, I think I have a picture here somewhere. Uh, yeah, so this was discovered right after the war in one of the um, SS barracks. This picture here is a critical photograph. It was discovered in one of the bedside tables of one of the SS barracks in another camp. And they, they could, by the... Uh, by the picture of the trees and the fence, someone could identify that as being Birkenau, Auschwitz Birkenau. And what that represents is the fact that the ovens were not sufficient, the crematoria were not sufficient, so they dug these huge trenches, or the prisoners had to dig, dig these huge trenches, and when the, uh, the dead bodies were taken out of the gas chamber, they were thrown into these trenches that were outside uh, the, uh, the chambers, the gas chambers, and they would burn them in the trenches. They would pour gasoline and naphtha over the dead bodies and burn them outside. And this is a very critical picture that proves that they were killing, that were burning people outside, killing people in the gas chambers and then burning them outside. So it's a very critical picture. This is why I told you that a lot of this information was discovered after the war rather than uh, known to us during the war. <coughs> so, um, 
When I was put into the uh, men's camp, into the clinic, I had to um, I had to do some work with a bunch of other kids, and we were pushing this cart, this wooden cart that had four wheels, and we were transporting uh, clothing of uh, prisoner clothing, people that were killed in the gas chambers, of course, had to undress and uh, had to leave all their clothing uh, behind. So we were taking clothing out of one warehouse and moving it to another warehouse and, uh, and uh, sorting it out. Here is an example of one of the warehouses that had nothing but uh, prisoner, uh, civilian clothing. All this clothing had to be sorted out, washed, cleaned, and then most of it was shipped to Germany uh, so the civilian population could use it. In, uh, in Germany. In, uh, in January of 1945, the Russian army was approaching Auschwitz, Birkenau. And uh, when the Russian army was less than 100 miles away, maybe 150 miles away, uh, Auschwitz was being evacuated. And um, we were being, we went on a death march from uh, Birkenau to a railroad station that was about 35 or 36 miles away. And uh, through the snow, through the January snow, very cold, very freezing, uh, no food, no water, um, was a two-day death march. Of course, the reason for it being called a death march is because about a third of the people died uh, because they couldn't walk. Uh, I was under the uh, control under the protection of those two Polish dentists. They're walking next to me. And after the first day, uh, I started hallucinating. Um, again, no food, no water, and just walk, you know, walk 20, 25 miles a day. So I started hallucinating. I started seeing things that were not there. We were walking through a Polish village, and I was reading these signs. Uh, they were on top of the stores, um, you know, a sign like watchmaker, uh, 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 food store, whatever. I was reading them in Czech. I was actually hallucinating. I was reading everything in Czech. I was translating and I was visualizing like I was home in Prague. I'm reading all this stuff in Czech. And I kind of, I'm kind of falling in and out out of this hallucination. And I, I, re I realized it, that I was, I was losing it. And I said to one of the dentists, I said, I can't walk anymore, I've, I'm done, I can't walk. They forced me to walk. They grabbed me, forced me to walk. But we made the walk, which was about 35, 40 miles to the, to the railroad station. Uh, I believe in German that the railroad station was called Gleiwitz. So we arrived in Gleiwitz and we were put on open coal car trains. Now these are trains, these are wagons that are designed to carry coal because again they did not want to allocate passenger cars for us, for the prisoners. These were all allocated for the German army. So we were put in open coal cars and we were transported to this concentration camp which was called Mauthausen. Mauthausen was in Austria. We went through we went through a part of Czech Republic into Austria from Poland. We had to cross the Czech Republic into Austria. As we were crossing the Czech Republic, the train stopped and because we were in open cars, the women that just came from the market were throwing bread and apples and sugar and uh, lemons into the open cars because they knew that we were prisoners and we could speak Czech. We told them, hey, we need we need food, give us food. So they were throwing all this stuff into the open cars. And uh, the train starts moving. And uh, about half an hour later, somebody ended up with a bag of lemons. And somebody ended up with a bag of sugar. And uh, we were able to, when the train stopped, we were able to go out and get some snow and bring the snow back into the train. And we made lemon ice using sugar and snow. 
um, and the lemons that we had. And we had a ball. We were eating lemon ice for about an hour after that. And of course, lemon ice is one of my favorite now. <laughs> but um, we ended up in uh, we ended up in this camp here. This is uh, this is the entrance to uh, to the uh, Austrian camp called Mauthausen, one of the oldest, biggest camps in Austria. Uh, I think it was built like in 1938 or 39. This was a vicious camp, really bad. Um, this was uh, this was a camp. We were only there, luckily, about a week or two. This was a camp. Uh, was multinational, Polish, French, Belgian, Czech, German, American prisoners that were shut down over uh, over Germany. All kinds of nationalities. It was a vicious camp from the standpoint of disease and hunger. Uh, hunger was just terrible in this camp. Uh, it was known for its quarry, stone quarry, and many prisoners died uh, working in this stone quarry in Mauthausen. Uh, this, this is what the prisoners looked like when the American army um, liberated Mauthausen on May 5th, uh, 1945. Everybody was skin and bone. Here is a 14-year-old uh, kid, again, taken by the American army. Skin and bone. This is what we look like. Skin and bone. We could we could barely walk. Uh, we were moved from um, uh, from Mauthausen. We were moved about a week and a half after we were, after we arrived in Mauthausen. Um, the arrival in Mauthausen was interesting. We arrived at night, and uh, it was really cold. And we arrived at night. We went up those steps, which were terrible to go up very tiring, about, I think, 90 steps over, 100 steps. And we arrived at the main gate. We went through the main gate, and then we waited <coughs> about uh, an hour outside to go into the showers. And uh, two Mauthausen prisoners, so I'm staying, standing in line with these two Polish dentists next to me, and two Mauthausen prisoners come up to us, and they whisper something to one of the Polish uh, dentists. And the dentist looks at me and starts to cry. And I said, what, what's going on? Why are you upset? He says, well, he just said to me, give me your shoes, you guys are going to be gassed. So um, we, of course, didn't give up our shoes. We went through the showers, we were not gassed. We went through the showers, but whether it was a ploy on the part of the other prisoner, we don't know. Maybe he really thought we were going to be guests. I don't know. But anyway, we got through the showers and uh, we got into the proper camp proper and uh, we were immediately on another huge starvation diet. I mean, unbelievable. Uh, th there are things that I saw there that people were eating. They were eating, they were eating their own shoelaces. They were so hungry. So uh, from, uh, from Mauthausen, about a week and a half after arriving in Mauthausen, we were moved to another. This is, this is a picture of the, of the uh, dead bodies that the Americans found when they liberated Mauthausen. This is another pit that was used for dead bodies in Mauthausen. So the people that died were, would be thrown in the pit and then uh, covered with bulldozers, covered with dirt. They were not even burnt. They were just covered with dirt. So that that was that's a good sign of good uh, good example of what happened in Mauthausen. Uh, here is the uh, commandant of Mauthausen, uh, Frank Zierreich. He was uh, he tried to escape, but he was shot by the Americans. He was injured, and then he was caught and eventually executed uh, after the war. Uh, we were um, taken from uh, Mauthausen to a small camp called uh, uh, Melk. And we were in Melk for about, I don't have a picture here of Melk, but there is not really much to see. We were in Melk for about three months, <clears throat> mostly peeling potatoes for potato soup and uh, working in the kitchen for in the morning, typically. And uh, Melk wasn't too bad. 
it was not as bad as Mauthausen, not as threatening as Mauthausen. And uh, I don't think the disease level, uh, the typhus level in that was quite as bad. Uh, we were in that for about three months, and from that we walked uh, uh, back to Mauthausen. And we thought, oh my God, we are going to be back in this hell, which was Mauthausen, but we were put into a tent camp. These were huge army tents that could hold about 40 or 50 people, and we were there for about a week in the tent camp, uh, starving to death. And uh, one thing that was really strange that haunted me for a long time was uh, I lost my soup dish when I was in the tent camp in, uh, outside of Mauthausen. And I had this aluminum soup dish. And if you lose your, lose your soup dish, how are you going to get soup? Where are you going to put the soup? So I was desperate. And I was looking for another dish. dish. And I saw this this prisoner that I thought was dead, and he had a, uh, this metal dish right next to him. And I figured, well, he's dead. I'm going to take his dish. At least I'll be able to get some soup. So I bent over to, to pick up his soup dish, and I realized it's tied to his belt. It's tied with a piece of rope to his belt. And as I pull on it, he wakes up, he was not dead, he woke up. And I have now, I did pull it off his belt, and I have his soup dish now, but he's awake, he's not, he's not dead. And I'm moving away from him because I'm afraid he's gonna hit me or do something, and I'm running around with his soup dish, and he's chasing me. And uh, so I woke up to death, you know, almost. So he's chasing me, and finally a guard just stops me you know, I hand the, the guy the soup dish, and I, I don't know where I found the other soup dish, but I did find one eventually. And it was very embarrassing because I, I thought the guy was dead, and I figured, if he's dead, why not take his soup dish? But by the time I took it, it was too late to say, oh, I'm sorry, here is your soup dish. I thought you were dead, you know. So it was very, very confusing for a 12-year-old, but he did get back his soup dish, and I did feel guilty for the next 30 years, I think. So. Um, so we um, we walked from uh, so we were in a in a tent camp for about a week, and then we walked from the tent camp. You see Mount House up there on the upper right, and we walked all the way down to a concentration camp that you see on the left, very left bottom, that was called Gunz, Gunzkirchen. Gunzkirchen is a little village in uh, Austria, and Barbara and I were just there about three years ago. Um, and uh, we were in this camp in <coughs> Kunzkirchen, which was um, a total nightmare. It was a, I refer to it now when I'm making these presentations, I refer to it as a human dump. It was uh, basically what happened, the Germans, the, the SS ran out of time. And the American army was moving so fast that they couldn't really get us where they wanted to get us. So they dumped us into this fenced area in the woods, maybe eight or 10 acres that were fenced with a wire fence. Inside these um, pine, pine woods, outside the village of Gunzkirchen. And uh, we had very little food. We were there for almost a week. And we could not sleep inside. We, there were three huts, three or four huts in Gunzkirchen. Um, and a friend of mine and I tried to sleep in one of the huts one night, but there was just a dirt floor, and there were too many dead bodies on the floor. So we didn't want to sleep there because there were we were surrounded by dead by corpses. So the next day, and for the next four or five days, we slept outside. Uh, we made, uh, we used some uh, branches from trees. We used one blanket to make a tent using the branches, and then we covered ourselves with the other, with the second blanket. And we were there for about four days, for almost five days, and the first two days we got a piece of bread and a bowl of soup. And uh, day number three, no food, 
Day number four, no food or drink. Day number five, no food or drink. And I think it was either on day number five or six that I woke up in the morning. Now we are sleeping outside. I woke up maybe at 5.30 in the morning and I heard small arms fire. Machine gun fire and small arms, automatic weapon fire. And right away I thought, oh, they must be killing the prisoners. It, they they got to be killing the prisoners. Because I had no idea where the American army was. I didn't know if they were 50, uh, 50, uh, 50 miles away or 200 miles away. I had no clue. And uh, so I hear this machine gun fire and then about 20 minutes later, I look up and I see three of the military guards. These are not SS guards. These are military, German military guards, uh, elderly, 45, 50, 60 years old, with, with guns over their shoulder. They're holding this white sheet. They are just standing in a, in a cluster in a group of three and holding a white sheet. And as soon as I see that, I see the first GI walk in. First GI, you're right away, it's an American GI. So, um, so we uh, were liberated on uh, April 4th, 1945 by, uh, by Patton's 3rd Army, and thank God for Patton. As much as people criticize Patton, for being rough and gruff, uh, I tell you, if Patton would have been, if that army would have been another two or three days later, we would, most of us would have not made it. So thank God for Patton. Thank God for him being a real son of a bitch. Because he, he really moved the army, and, and, and you know, sometimes you gotta put up with this, with this kind of a personality because those are the people that get something done. So you gotta respect them for what they have accomplished. So every day was a matter of saving another 40 or 50,000 people. Because of Patton, I'm sure he would get 90% of the credit. Because of him, a lot of people survived. Because of his rapid movement of the, of the third army. So um, we're in, so, uh, we were liberated by the 71st um, Armored Division of the uh, 3rd Army, and we were when they when the when the American soldiers realized that we couldn't walk, or we, were, we were too weak to walk. They uh, put us on trucks, and uh, here is what Gunskir can look like. This is the picture taken by the 71st uh, uh, Division of the 3rd uh, Army. Um, they could not have, when we slept outside, just like this, like only we had a blanket over us. So the problem was they couldn't tell who was alive, who was not alive. They had to sort things out. They actually came back the next day because they didn't have the personnel to, uh, to do what they needed to do. So uh, uh, there was about, I forgot how many, 11,000 people there at that point. Maybe three or 4,000 were dead. Maybe five or six thousand were still alive. Uh, I don't really have the exact numbers. Uh, so we were uh, we were taken to a nearby town by truck. Uh, we were taken a time uh, to a town of Hershing. Hershing now is a big airport. It, 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 it's the airport that's it's the big airport outside of Vienna, about thirty or forty miles outside of Vienna. So we were taken into a school, put into a school in Hershing, and we were given American Army food and clothing, and I was able to take a shower, first shower in about a year and a half. Um, I, I looked in the mirror, I went to the bathroom there in that school where we were put in, and I simply did not recognize myself. Uh, I mean, I saw a, I saw a, a skeleton when I looked in the, in the mirror. So it was scary because I didn't think that was me. I was looking at somebody else. And uh, I have a couple of pictures here. Uh, what happened in, Hirsch, in Hershing is that uh, we were in this school, meaning maybe 20 or 30 of the boys that I knew um, from, uh, they were all Czechoslovakia, most of them. 
we were put up in this school and we had no way of figuring out how to get home. Nothing was running. The trains were not running. The buses were not running. We had trouble figuring out how do we get how, how do we get back to uh, Czechoslovakia. And and what happened was uh, three of the boys decided to jump a train, uh, jump a freight train, and somehow get to the Czech Republic via a freight train. Now by car, Prague was only about four hours away from Russia, from Austria. So by car it would have been easy, but I don't know how long it took by freight train, maybe six, seven hours. Well, uh, after about five weeks, these three kids decided that they're gonna jump a train, and they did. They apparently did because my father, who was already in Prague, just came from Germany to Prague. He was looking for me, and somebody told my dad, there are a couple of kids in this hospital in Prague. Why don't you find out from them? if they know where your son is. So he drove to the hospital and uh, went up to the second floor to, the, to their room and they said, yes, he is in Hershing, in this school, outside of the Hershing airport. And so my dad and his friend, policeman from Prague, drove the next day to Hershing and found me in this, in this school. So um, I, I uh, was reunited with my dad in Hershing, and uh, we got some gasoline for the car at the airport. We walked to the airport, and a couple of the kids helped us uh, get a couple of cans of gasoline from the from the American uh, soldiers that were at the airport, and uh, we put gasoline in the old uh, Opel that my dad got from the American Army. Uh, in, uh, when he was in Germany working with them for two or three weeks. And uh, so we put the gasoline in the Opel and drove to Prague. Uh, on the way to Prague, we stopped in a, in a farmhouse, Czech farmhouse. It was about nine or 10 in the morning. And we drove up to this Czech farmhouse and uh, a farm woman walked out. And my dad said to her, would you kindly be able to give us some breakfast? My, son just came from a concentration camp and we haven't had any food for, for a while, for a day or two, and she cooked us a big breakfast, about 20 or 30 scrambled eggs. First time I had scrambled eggs in about three years. So she gave us a big breakfast, of course, didn't ask for any money or anything. And we had a big breakfast um, as, we, as we entered the, uh, the Czech Republic and we drove to Prague and and we then stayed in Prague for the next uh, two or three years after we, after, uh, until we escaped uh, the communist regime in Prague. So uh, I have a few pictures I want to share with you. Uh, one of them is a picture of Dina, the artist that introduced me to her boyfriend, uh, Willy Brachman. And uh, that's Dina uh, after the war with her mother in, uh, in uh, Nice. Friends, and this is a picture of uh, my brother and, and me. Um, he's about he's about uh, he's about ten in that picture. Um, he's about yeah he's about eleven. I'm about five. No, he's about nine. I'm about five years old in this picture. Nine and five. And here is uh, my mother uh, and I. Again, I'm about five years old in that picture. And uh, here's a picture of my father, the physician. And this is a picture of me uh, about uh, five months, four or five months after the war. So uh, this concludes uh, my narrative. And uh, if any of you have any questions, I will gladly um, try to answer them now. Thank you. Frank, I think I speak for every soul in this room. I think everyone must feel just like me. I have no words, no words to say. Uh, we've all read, we've all seen films about the Holocaust, but I don't know that any of us have ever heard firsthand the story from Survivor. Thank you so much.
Yeah. Are you willing to take questions? Sure. Yeah. I have a question. Um, at, at the end of the heard you say that there was a clinic, a clinic, a, a primitive clinic at the concentration camp. Is that correct? That's really well, that's, I'm trying to figure out why they would have a clinic uh, if they're going to kill everybody. So that was confusing. Well, they were, they, were, they were not going to kill their workers. They still needed, they still, basically, why did they, why did they have a clinic if, if the life was so, uh, frivolous or if the life was not important. Well, they still wanted to retain some of the workers that worked in the nearby, nearby factories. And I think some of them had to be trained if they were doing special, some special assembly work or whatever. So um, it was done mostly for people that had minor injuries that, that could be rehabilitated in some way and still be put back to work. That's a good question though. Uh, what happened to the Polish Jets, you know? Uh, they immigrated to Israel okay. because I got a letter um, when I was living in, I think when I was living in Prague, I can't remember if it was, if I was here already or in Prague, but I know that after the war, I, com I, I communicated with one of them who ended up in, I think they both ended up in Israel. So they were Jewish background? Models. Yeah, yes, they were Polish, they were Jewish, yeah. And I know, I found out from Dina's testimony, she has a, she did a two hour or more um, testimony that I saw, where she mentioned that when she first met Willie, she told him, you look ridiculous, you are missing those two front teeth, you look ridiculous. Oh you need to have that fixed, and apparently they are the two that replaced his two front teeth. That's how he got to know that. So uh, the, the dots came together after the war. I realized that for years I tried to figure out how did, how did I end up in this clinic, which was like an like a oasis compared to all the other places where I could have ended up. How did I end up with, in this clinic? And I realized, when I heard Dina's testimony about the two dentists, I realized the connection between Willie and the two dentists, and then Willie arranging it for me to be under their umbrella, so to speak. Back there. Uh, Frank, um, you say you uh, teach class um, up in Purdue. Um, have you gone into or been invited to go to any high schools or uh, areas where there's younger people who, quite frankly, um, I fear that this is going to be somewhat forgotten. And this needs to be addressed, and this needs to be taught. And if they could have sat in this room today and heard that, I think there would be a totally different uh, feeling amongst those that maybe are uh, doubtful, let's say, or it could have been this bad that everybody's talking about and so forth. So, good question. So, so in the last, in the last 12 or 10 or 12 years, I've spoken to more than 100 high schools and more than maybe 10,000 or 15,000 students. Right. Wow. Frank, your story is so powerful and so important. It, has it been captured in a book or on film? Uh, this has to be documented with all the details and all of your experiences. So a film was made by a, a high school instructor in uh, visual communications, filmmaking, uh, in Pennsylvania. And that film was released about seven years ago, and it's called Misha's Fugue, like the like the uh, box composition fugue, like a, a musical composition, a fugue, F-U-G-U-E. So fugue has got two meanings. It can be a, a, a musical uh, structure. Uh, it can also be a psychiatric term which means few from running away. The refugee is, that's where the word refugee comes from, few to run. 
So the idea of the fugue came from me transporting myself into another world, meaning I was not in Poland, I was in Prague. So, uh, so that psychiatric, psychiatric term is called fugue. And uh, it's very common among people that are under a lot of stress that they will mentally put themselves in another location. They, they take themselves out of the real location into a location of fantasy or into a, a, a imaginary, a, a imagination takes them into another um, scenario. That's what I did when I was under stress. So it's very common, by the way. I'm not, not nothing you know about it. So the film is called um, Misha's, so Misha, M-I-S-A, with an apostrophe S, Fugue. And it's about my family, about the concentration camp experiences. It's about Dina, it's about Willie, it's about my parents, my mother. Uh, Dina is mentioned in the movie. It's about a one hour and 30 minute or one hour and 40 minute movie. It was done uh, by, a, uh, by roughly 200 students took part in making that movie. They wrote the music, they played the music, uh, they did the art, the art department did the art, the English department worked on the storytelling, um, the musical department did the, uh, played the orchestra and did the, did the singing. So about 200 students uh, in, uh, from a small high school in Pennsylvania did the movie. And the movie is downloadable from the internet. And it's called Misha's Few. And it was done as a, um, on a non-profit basis. So we're not allowed from an IRS standpoint, we are not allowed to make a penny. It was done intentionally. I didn't want to make this a commercial uh, undertaking. So it was done strictly for um, educational purposes. And we have already sent out three or 4,000 uh, DVDs around the world. And, but now that it's available via the internet, uh, we're not selling any more DVDs. It's all, it's all downloadable. So it's on file sharing? Uh, yeah, yeah. It's, it's a, it's, it's, or... I think they charge a ridiculous amount of money. I saw, I saw one of them. Somebody was charging $70, $70 65 or $70 to download it from the internet, it's ridiculous. I don't know who's doing that, but uh, I know it can be done cheaper, can be gotten cheaper. We just found it on Prime Video. Okay. Does it say how much it is? No, it, it's just available on Prime Video. It's your story, it's got oh, your picture. Okay. Wow. Very cool. Right. Were you able to reclaim your apartment in Prague or any of your possessions? Well, we were able to reclaim the, uh, the house, the apartment house, but uh, the problem with an apartment house like that, first of all, it, it was um, uh, there were two or three uh, critical things happened. Uh, first of all, it was uh, uh, owned not just by, it was inherited not just by me, but several of my cousins and relatives. And secondly, it was pretty run down. So from a saleability standpoint, um, if you were to buy that apartment, you would probably end up putting hundreds of thousands of dollars into it because of the heating system and the new roof and all that stuff. So yeah, we, we did get some money back, but it was negligible when we sold it. There's a lot of the art that was stolen by the Nazis. We didn't get any of that back, no. We, we, we were able to smuggle some stuff out, out of the apartment when we, uh, when we moved out. But uh, in terms of furniture and carpets and stuff like that, we lost 99% of it. Uh, Dr. Sandler, you have any questions? Is there a story how you came here to Indianapolis? Uh, I came, let's see, uh, so, so my father remarried after the war 
and his, um, my stepmother, his wife, his second wife, was living in England. And uh, so we, we escaped to England, my father and I. And then we lived in England for two years, and then we came to this country in 1951, spring of 1951. And my dad um, was able to practice medicine in, in New York City uh, till 67. And uh, I went to, I, I finished high school in New York City and I went to college in Brooklyn, New York. And I studied industrial design and I worked um, for uh, several um, large companies, American companies, uh, Ford Motor, motor, motor Company, uh, General Electric. Uh, I retired from the industry as a product designer and I was a new product development and design. I, I retired uh, in 2002 and then uh, it was just about at that time when I was asked to, um, to do a class at Purdue in their School of Design and I'm still doing it. I just came there, I, I was just there yesterday. So I'm still doing, um, I'm teaching um, a class in uh, new product development and innovation, innovative thinking. And we, I met Barbara, my wife, um, in, um, I think it was in 58 that we met. Uh, I was working for GE, General Electric. I was designing small appliances for GE in uh, Bridgeport, Connecticut, in their, which was their headquarters for small appliances. And I was a designer there. Uh, and Barbara was teaching school. We met in Connecticut in 1958, and then we married in, uh, 1961, married in 61. So we've been married how long? 50, 57, 58, 58 years. Took us that long to get along. <laughs> uh, well, uh, I want to know about your schooling. Here I am. Oh, who's, oh, oh, I'm sorry. I was looking the other way. How did you make up your schooling after you... I was terrible. Well... So, so, I, so basically I went from first grade to junior high. So basically I missed second grade, third grade, fourth grade, and fifth grade. And um, what really made it bad was um, the fact that the that the school system in Prague was so antiquated, it was really bad. The instructors were bad, the facilities were bad, everything was, there was not one thing that was good about the school system. So um, it was very difficult, and, but I made it through. Um, um, I did a little bit of counseling, I think, in math for a while, uh, but I made it through and uh, when we escaped, let's see, I was just started my last year of high school. I was 17, I was just beginning my last year of high school. And uh, when we got to London, I, was, I told everybody in London, all my friends, I said to them, um, I said, I did not escape from communism, I escaped from calculus. <laughs> I absolutely hated calculus, I thought that I thought that some mathematical idiot invented calculus and forced it on everybody else who couldn't care less about it and who would probably never use it again ever in their lifetime. So I escaped calculus, not just communism. I'm so glad to escape calculus. One more question? Yeah. Frank, I think all of us have heard the expression Life gives you lemons, you make lemonade. <laughs> yeah. Nice. Nice. Yeah. There you go. <laughs> Any other questions? All right, thank you very much.